We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, and to secure to all its citizens justice, social, economic, and political, liberty of thought, expression, belief, faith, and worship, equality of status and of opportunity, and to promote among them all fraternity, assuring the dignity of the individual and the unity and integrity of the nation. In our Constituent Assembly this 26th day of November 1949, to hereby adopt, enact, and give to ourselves this Constitution. That was Geeta Sagal reading the preamble to the Constitution of India. You're listening to the National Secular Society podcast, hosted by Emma Park. In this episode, Geeta, a human rights activist and honorary associate of the NSS, will be speaking to me about secularism in India and the UK. We will be discussing the Hindutva movement and the threat it poses to secularism in India, and how secularists have been reading out parts of the constitution as an act of protest. We'll also be looking at how the pro-Hindutva government of Prime Minister Modi is using the coronavirus pandemic to crack down on dissent, and at the wider influence of Hindu nationalism on politics in Britain and in the US. Finally, we will consider how the ideology of Hindutva is bringing its version of Hinduism closer to a monotheistic religion. Geeta, thanks for reading out that preamble to the Constitution of India. I know that it, it actually says that India is um, a social, socialist, secular, democratic republic. It specifically got that word secular in. Was, was that something that was there from the beginning? Well, secularism was a very precious ideal in India at independence and during the discussion uh, discussions that took place in the Constituent Assembly. But the word secular was not inserted until much later. And it is an irony that it was actually at a very dark period in Indian history, the emergency in the 19, mid-1970s, that the term secular was actually inserted into the Constitution. But the values of the original Constituent Assembly were very definitely to see Indian nationalism as a product of a very plural nation and to not respond to the creation of Pakistan, which was supposed to be a Muslim homeland, by creating a Hindu homeland, but rather to stand very firmly against the idea of India as a state that was a homeland only for Hindus, but say it was a homeland for all those who had been born in that um, in India, even if, uh, as the constitution later says, even if they're, uh, they're, they were now living in Pakistan, that they would still have access to Indian citizenship. And it doesn't specify that only Hindus would have access to Indian citizenship. Um, so Indian Muslims were very clearly, by um, the Indian founding fathers and mothers, included within the idea of India as a plural nation. So that, I think that's really, really important. That's one thing. And the, the other thing that we often don't mention or understand is the absence of the idea that God or any God or any deity of any sort, any form of theism was responsible for giving us in India rights. Um, the the preamble clearly states that Indians gave themselves the rights um, that uh, were in the constitution. In contrast, well, well, Britain has had this tradition of having the established church always there. The Hindutva movement, which has something perhaps similar, originated as very much a minority movement in India, didn't it? It did. It's now nearly a hundred years old. Um, uh, so it was invented. Uh, the the term Hindutva was in, uh, had origins in in nineteenth century religious reform movements, but the term Hindutva was invented in nineteen twenty three. And what does um, it literally mean? It means the idea that India is a state of Hindus, and that India is both the fatherland and the holy land of its people, and therefore the people who have a religion that is supposed to have come from abroad, uh, outside the boundaries of India, are not true Indians. So that means, of course, Muslims, uh, Christians, uh, 
cannot be true Indians. Um, and so the idea of Hindutva is the a political uh, idea of Hinduism, which made it um, the ruling ideology of the state. In other words, to overturn the idea of a constitution that is A, doesn't have a religion in the constitution, and B, that guarantees the rights of all its citizens, no matter what religion they are. In other words, Hindutva is directly in conflict with secularism. It's directly in conflict with secularism and with the Indian constitution as it stands. And that's why the reading of the preamble to the constitution became one of the most powerful tools of the resistance movement against um, Hindu majoritarianism and against the idea that people who cannot prove their citizenship by the production of dozens of documents to which they may have no access and therefore may be actually stripped of being Indian citizens, even though they've never been in any other country and have nowhere else to go. Uh, you know, the idea that they that they were citizens of India became, and that they had rights under the secular constitution, it became the sort of rallying cry of a movement that, that had been going on really until the coronavirus crisis uh, hit India. So, so people were still proponents of secularism, were still reading out the constitution even recently? Very recently, all th through uh, last year and early this year, uh, it became an activity that was a popular activity right across India. So uh, students stood in, and people read it out aloud in groups as if they were making a vow. Uh, as if they were committing themselves to this idea of human rights and civil liberties and to secularism. And so they read it out in groups, uh, groups of students read it out, uh, groups of lawyers read it out on the lawns of, uh, you know, of, of uh, the courthouses. Um, Muslim women particularly have uh, had mobilized all over India uh, uh, apparently quite spontaneously, first in Delhi in an area called Shaheen Bagh, then in many, many other places where they staged sit-ins, where they sat through the coldest winter we've known in a hundred years. And what, what did they want? Um, for, I mean, the, the Muslim women who were, were reading out the constitution, what was their aim? They were, they were claiming their fundamental right to be recognized as Indians and citizens of India and their rights under the secular constitution, which they believed protected them. Uh, and they were doing this uh, at, in cons at considerable danger to themselves because quite apart from any action the government might take, it was absolutely freezing. So they were protesting against new the, the promulgation of new laws, one of which was a law that supposedly was a law for the protection of refugees. And that fast-tracked certain categories of people from certain neighboring countries, which are uh, Muslim majority countries, so Pakistan, Bangladesh, for instance, uh, but not all our neighbors, like not Sri Lanka, it's fast-tracked the citizens, uh, people who are Hindus, and I think even Christians, uh, it, as citizens of, um, as, as, uh, to, give, to give them refugee status, if they were in India. Are these people who are already living in India at the time? They were already living in India, and by fast tracking, I mean they may have been living in India for years. So it wasn't that they were, they were, you know, it was it was creating a pathway to citizenship. So there are lots of different um, refugees who've come, but but these laws that have been recently introduced by Modi's government, they they're trying to um, fast track refugee status for some refugees, but not for Muslims on the basis of religion. Yes, on solely on the basis of religion. So Rohingyas, for instance, who also have come to India quite recently from Myanmar, they were not would not have been included in this, you know, and were at risk of being sent back. So, so one, this was the first law that used a religious basis solely. This is not to say that religious persecution doesn't exist in those countries. Obviously it does, and obviously some people would need refugee status or have already fled to India and are living in India and would need their status regularized. Um, 
but it also but uh, so that's that's one law that they that 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 was kind of posing as as an enabling law but set this dangerous precedent of introducing a citizenship based on religion since the coronavirus um what's happened to those tensions between the secularists and the hindutva supporters well as with everywhere in the world this corona virus has intensified other inequalities and increased the authoritarian actions of the government um so it's brought into sharp focus the differences between secular and universalist approaches based on public health and concern for people and sort of top down authoritarian measures so a number of things are happening one is that all these movements because of course they were gathering in public places um they and even though they were trying some of them were trying to practice isolation and distancing measures you know within those like reducing the number of people uh in the sit in and keeping them separate from each other and so on they basically had to close down but how how specifically um has has this lockdown has the authoritarian government used it to to quell or to put put a stop to um protest against against these laws so it it it, it of course uh ended these uh muslim women's protests that were sit ins uh because people couldn't publicly sit in anymore so those protests that had been happening all over india had to be ended uh but even more seriously than that uh is that there has been a clamp down on a huge number of uh uh people who are prominent human rights defenders and civil society activists so in my bradlaw lecture i to- which was 2 years ago now i discussed how there were attacks on people who had uh, who, who were well known um, human rights advocates and how some of them had been able to get bail at that point because uh, there had been attempts uh, uh, the you know their lawyers had uh, gone to court and and in some cases the courts had listened and in fact the supreme court had said that defense is uh, dissent is a safety valve it's very important in a society it shouldn't be shut down and some people had been granted bail on 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 charges that appeared to be absurd because they were extremely serious charges that were being pursued by regional police force rather than the national uh you know crime agencies uh, you know the charges included attempt to murder the prime minister uh you know gathering arms i mean these serious uh, terrorism charges uh but anyway some people at that time uh briefly uh were given relief and bail but then some of them were arrested and now the others who were not arrested at that time have been arrested along with a number of other prominent uh journalists who are under attack uh news you know proprietors of online and other uh newspapers uh the media is much more heavily controlled not because it has overt censorship but because the ownership of the media has largely gone into hands which are very sympathetic to the government and where they will only hire people who uh you know are attack dogs for uh various kinds of hindutva politics so what what's the outlook would you say for secularism in india in the near and medium future the outlook at the moment is very bleak because uh the weak opposition and the um the, the fact that there there is not a very concerted parliamentary opposition uh to the government that looks like it can at national level win another election and restore uh some of the secular principles um the media is being increasingly controlled um people who do stand out are being threatened or intimidated or arrested um uh these popular movements at the moment have no room to maneuver because they can't come out in masses on the streets uh because of the corona virus situation and in in fact what they're doing and i think this is where we have to try and gather some hope from the bleakness of the situation is that they're facing the 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 oppositional movements which are ra- largely 
civil society movements of people who are progressive, who uh, some of whom are on the left, who are liberals, um, are mobilizing in order to uh, face the humanitarian crisis that is there. Modi himself, is he? does he identify as a member of the Hindutva movement? Yes, Modi is a product, a, a proud product. I mean, I'm not, I'm not imputing anything to him that he wouldn't be proud to own. He was trained in the Hindutva movement. He was a functionary of uh, one of its main uh, components, which is uh, a large charitable organization that says that it's not a political organization, uh, uh, but which is the ruling intelligence uh, behind the political party, BJP, that is in power. So Modi cut his teeth as uh, uh, somebody in that movement. He's written uh, extensively uh, about the ideologues of the Hindutva movement, um, who themselves were admirers of uh, the German and Italian fascists. Um, and he's uh, you know, shown how much he admires their writing and their, their commitment. Uh, so he has been part of that movement. He himself is a very, very skilled user of the of the media and of social media, in particular, um, and has fi more than fifty six million followers on Twitter. Um, he himself only follows about two thousand people, but among the people he follows are people who praised those who were involved with. Uh, lynchings of Muslims in uh, because they were deemed to be um, eating beef, you know, or they were trans they were thought to be transporting cattle for slaughter. Um, how about in the UK? Because the Hindutva is an international movement these days, isn't it? It's, it's spread both to the UK and the US and further afield. How, how far is it influential within the UK? Let's remember that when Prime Minister Modi came to uh, the UK, when he came to London a few years ago, he was greeted as a rock star at Wembley. And who was his supporting act? And his, you know, the, the person who introduced him, it was none other than David Cameron, who hoped to that some of Modi's stardust would run off, rub off on him. Um, and at the same time, the uh, members of the Labour Party, not Jeremy Corbyn in this instance, but other members of the Labour Party, like Keith Vaz and, and Barry Gardner, uh, were vying uh, to, um, you know, give the, you know, parts of their salaries and so on to uh, fund this jamboree at uh, Wembley and also take advantage of it. So Hindutva is very well embedded in all areas of British political life. Are there any public figures who are... Um... Who, who support the Hindutva movement? Well, Preeti Patel, our very own Home Secretary in Britain, has welcomed senior figures in the Hindutva movement to HSS meetings, has been very vocal in support of it, has attacked uh, those Indians who were critical of the election of Modi. I think she went on Newsnight uh, to, you know, to, she's a very critical of uh, people like Anish Kapoor. Uh, the famous sculptor Anish Kapoor had warned of the dangers of Hindutva and she uh, you know, she she sort of attacked all these, uh, uh, you know, Indian uh, Br British people of Indian origin who who were who were raising a warning about uh, Hindutva. What's her basic position? Is her position that how how does she view Hindutva? I think she views Prime Minister Modi as a close ally of uh, the Conservative Party. Um, I mean, in the past, and and you know. Uh, and recently, I mean, there have definitely been MPs on all sides of the House who are pro-Hindutva. So on, in Labour, as I said, Barry Gardner was a prominent one uh, who was pro-Hindutva. But, but it's absolutely embedded in the thinking of uh, the Conservative Party at the moment and, and seems to have thrown its lot in with them as internationally Modi is close to Trump and also had rallies in America where you know, Trump also attended, and so on. So, you know, there's there's a constellation of right wing political leaders. Uh, Bolsonaro in Brazil is another one who've come together, um, you know, to promote very similar views. 
uh, to support each other's authoritarian tendencies through this massive humanitarian crisis that we face. So, so you see, um, Hindu nat- nationalism um, as part of a, a wider global um, authoritarian trend. I see Hindu nationalism as part of a wider global authoritarian trend, which is much older than many of the other authoritarian trends. So sometimes it's seen as another populist movement. And to me, the word populism tends to imply something that's kind of risen almost from nowhere, that's just grabbed you know, various ideas that are out in the ether and then use them towards, you know, uh, in a in a convincing way, uh, you know, towards authoritarian purposes. But the Hindutva movement is a very disciplined movement. Uh, it's worked very hard for a century uh, for its ideas to become mainstream. It has built up these huge interna- you know, both in India and internationally, um, these uh, charitable and cultural structures which by the way, I wonder where they are now because they have very good command structures and exist all over India and in other parts of the world in order to raise money and to be on the street doing humanitarian aid. But you're not seeing, you're not seeing that today since the coronavirus. Well, I think they're doing some food distribution and things like that, but they're doing it um, uh, you know, there are reports coming in that, that where they are distributing food, they're for, forcing Muslims in particular to shout Hindutva slogans. So Jai Shri Ram, which means victory to, to Ram, to the God Ram. In itself, nothing wrong with the slogan as uh, if, it, if it's only used as a religious, in a religious context. But when it's used in a political context, it's about forcing everybody to recognize that there's one supreme God, which is also really a, a really rather odd idea of tradition for traditional Hindus who believe in uh, either in no particular deity or in many deities, but not in one, you know, not in one uh, particular one. Um, and, you know, forcing Muslims to acknowledge him, you know, the idea of Ram as their supreme master and only to get aid on, you know, a food packet on that basis. Do you think Hindutva is changing the nature of Hinduism? Hindutva is fundamentally about changing the nature of Hinduism. So it's the idea that the, the Hindutva movement has, has changed Hinduism by, by making the god Ram more important and uh, making it almost like a monotheistic re- religion. Yes, it's creating a sort of imitation of some of, uh, of the monotheistic. It's taking, it's taking some of the original ideas of Hindutva, which were not about the god Ram. It was, as I said, about creating this modern Hindu identity that kind of uh, that kind of leapt over, you know, the traditional caste divisions in Hindu society and making a more unitary identity of it. But in the course of doing that, what they've done is they've grabbed other images and leaders. So, so Ram is a very popular deity. The idea of Ram, you know, is popular to a lot of Hindus uh, in their worship. And and Gandhi also talked about Ram Rajya, you know, the the rule of Ram as 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 the perfect kingdom, but it's not something that he wanted to enact in law. So now you have this idea of this very beloved figure in Hindu mythology, in in the Hindu imagination, being transported into this um, you know aggressive warrior who is the preeminent god, and where there's a specific place like a Mecca. Uh, you know, where Hindus can go and worship, you know, at this origin point. Uh, And Hinduism traditionally has always resisted that specific, precise, you know, one precise God and one precise origin. That's very interesting. So, Gita, just a a final question. What's your next step in this um, fight against the Hindutva? Well, I think, you know, to talk about my next step, I want to go back to the origin of the secular movement, you know, which you've been discussing in the series of podcasts, and to go back to Charles Bradlaugh and what he represented. And he had a very close connection with Indian nationalism. So he supported Irish home rule, and he supported uh, Indian freedom. And at the request of Indian nationalists and having checked with his amazing constituents who kept electing him to parliament, even though he couldn't actually take his oath for the longest time and and actually sit in parliament. Um, So he 
checked with them whether he could spend some of his time working on behalf of Indian interests because there were no you know people representing them in parliament and he represented Indian interests and raised the issue of unfair trade and of famine in India and he forced the British government to issue measures of famine relief now that that um activism on behalf of Bradlaugh shows us that at its inception, secularism was part of a wider movement for both liberty and equality. And so he put himself on the side of Indian liberty when he spoke at a con conference of Congress in the late 1880s, in 1889. And he said that, you know, let let me, he, he warned against uh, divisions between Hindus and Muslims and called for unity, uh, but he put himself on the side of liberty, which was the absolute opposite of people supporting the British Raj, who said, uh, who enhanced the divisions between Hindus and Muslims and said that the Raj were the only people who could manage these children and keep these divisions in check. And he clearly saw this was a fight to be overcome, not by more colonialism, but by moving towards liberty. So do you see yourself as carrying on Bradlaugh's um, secularist um, values of, of equality and liberty? I think the, the, yes, and they're twin values. They're not about one or the other. And so we see in the state of India, in, in the state of Kerala in India, there's a southern state, which is actually communist ruled. Now in India, communists have to rule by democracy, by democratic means, they have to be elected that state has stood against religious superstition in Hindu temples. Um, it, uh, when the coronavirus came very early on in the crisis, when the very first cases were detected as having come into that state, they introduced track and tracing measures. You know, um, they, they, they locked down very early, long before the, 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 the national lockdown, uh, they sent children home from school, but they also organized relief efforts, working with local NGOs and working with state paid like childcare workers, set, you know, sending them with meals to the houses of the children who were in the nurseries. So they did both at the same time. And they have had a very, very successful fight against Corona, uh, 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 against the virus, as well as a humanitarian policy. And in their background, is a very strong defense of secular traditions and against religious superstition, where, where they took a strong stand against the, the refusal of temples to admit women of a certain age uh, because they might be menstruating. So they've done all those things. And it can be done even in a poor country and even in this gravest crisis of our times. And, and you, you yourself, what, what are your immediate plans? I'm working with uh, the One Law for All campaign, which includes South All Black Sisters, uh, uh, on um, issues that are concerned both with Hindutva, but also with the British government's vast tolerance for Sharia law. Uh, uh, and people you know, think this is something that only the left tolerates. And I'd like uh, your listeners to understand that, that the British government is allowing uh, the Sharia councils to, to exist and is pushing women back into them by refusing to allow, for instance, marriages to be voided and for women to actually get relief in, in British courts. So we go on fighting around the things that need to be done. Well, Gita, thank you very much. That's a very interesting conversation with a lot for listeners to go back, go and think about. Certainly, I'll be thinking about that a lot in the next few weeks. Um, so thank you again and best of luck. And you, Emma. Thank you. That was episode 26 of the National Secular Society podcast hosted by Emma Park. My guest speaker was Gita Sagal. If you would like to help us challenge unfair religious privilege and support freedom of and from religion in Britain today, why not become a member of the NSS? Full details are on our website at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you like this podcast, you can find more episodes and more information about this episode on the website. Thanks for listening.